Hi, John Herman here, doing another lesson with you. This week, I'd like to begin a two-part study on Satan and angels. What a combo. I plan on starting with Satan today and finishing with angels next week. I'll save the best for last. To start with, I'd like to ask you if you believe that Satan or the devil really exists. Or does the evil in the world stem from the minds and hearts of men? A surprising number of people do not believe in his existence. One professor at Luther College asked his students if they believed the existence of Satan, and only about a half raised their hands. As expected, the ELCA does not appear to take a firm stand. They basically say that some Lutherans believe, some do not. I, for one, believe in his existence. In the Gospels, Jesus makes 25 of the 29 references to Satan. He carried out conversations with him in his temptations in the wilderness. He obviously believed in a personal Satan. What do we know about this great adversary? In the following discussion, there are scriptural re references that support all of the ideas that I'm presenting. I've admitted the specific verses for brevity because there are so many, but I'd be happy to share them with you if you're interested. So what about his name? What's in a name? The name Satan means adversary. The word devil means accuser, and he is both. There are other terms that refer to him in the Bible as the tempter, the evil one, the father of lies, the prince of darkness, and so forth. So where did he come from? There are many suggestions, of course, but the most prevalent seems to be the accounts of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jude, and particularly Revelation 12. He was an angel named Lucifer, created by God, who rebelled against God due to his pride and was subsequently thrown down to the earth with his minions, where he now has reign. So, what made him rebel? That's an easy one. One word will answer it. Pride. God created his creatures with free will. Lucifer wanted to be on the same level as his creator. He was not happy that God was getting all the recognition and glory. Pride is what did him in. It was the first sin. Think of Adam and Eve. The serpent offered them the opportunity to be like God, and they <clears throat> bit, so to speak. Satan wanted this recognition so much that he offered Jesus the world if he would only worship him. So what does Satan really want with us? Why does he want our very souls? His insatiable thirst for control and dominion mean that he wants every part of us to be a part of him. He dreams of the day when we can express ourselves only through him. He'll be in total control. He wants our total allegiance. By convincing us to sin against God, he is getting his wish. We can't serve two masters. God wants our souls too. So what's the difference here? Think about that. The way I see it, it's the difference between pride and love. So, does Satan act alone? In Revelation 12, it records that when Satan was cast down to the earth, he took with him a third of all the angels. These beings serve Satan in his quest for control. Further, when Christ came to earth, there was a flurry of demonic activity because of Jesus' attack on Satan's kingdom. Remember the murder of all the infants after Jesus' birth? Who do you think orchestrated that? So where does he rule? In the Bible, Satan has, be called, has been called the ruler of this world, the god of this age, the prince of the power of the air. In 1 John, it declares the whole world is under the control of the evil one. In other words, 
Satan controls the world's systems, including its governments. He's free to roam the earth and apparently has access to heaven as well. Peter warns us to be controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So, does Satan have any limitations? Well, yes, the answer is yes. Because he was created by God, he cannot have all the strength of God. The created one is never more powerful than the one who created him. Satan does have vast power, but it is subject to God's restrictions. He's also not all-knowing, as God is. Satan's very intelligent, but he's not very wise. He thought he could destroy the child Christ. He also believed that he could defeat God after he rebelled. Satan can control false prophets who spread half-truths and lies. Now, there's no indication in scripture that he can read thoughts. However, he's a very good at predicting our behavior because he's an expert on human nature. We're really not that too hard to understand. Satan is not omnipresent. He cannot be in every place at every time as God can. However, he has a large number of demons under him and they can be dispersed throughout the world and thereby make his power felt. So those are some of his limitations, but what about his strengths? Well, first of all, he has the whole world of unbelievers under his control. These are the folks of the world who believe in his lies and succumb to his temptations. Satan can influence and blind us. He can prevent the gospel from entering a person's heart. He speaks through fortune tellers, cult leaders, and false preachers. He preys upon the gullible and the prideful. Satan can control a person's body, as we have seen in the Bible uh, about the many people that Jesus and the disciples healed by driving out demons. He can influence governments and nations. In the book of Daniel, there's mention of the prince of the Persian kingdom, and the prince here refers to Satan. This was a demon who the angel Michael helped to defeat. Satan's main activity is to accuse us before God. Remember Job, where he told God that the only reason Job worshipped him was because of what God had given him. His goal is to have God reject us. So, how can we protect ourselves from the power of Satan? We have to educate ourselves as to how Satan works and act and acts to enter and control our lives. We know that he's powerful and crafty. We also know that he will be defeated in the end so that things are not hopeless for us. In Ephesians 6, Paul tells us to put on the armor of God because our enemy is not of flesh and blood, but it is the power of a dark world ruled by spiritual forces. Paul talks in metaphorical terms about this armor, and I think you probably will remember what I'm talking about. He's used words like um, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and prayer, all being the armor of God. Now, how does, what are a few of the methods that Satan uses to carry out his evil work? Well, probably the most prevalent one is temptation. He can use direct suggestion as he did with Judas. He entered Judas' mind and convinced him to betray Jesus. Or he can exploit a person's weakness in order for them to sin such as offering a recovering alcoholic just one little drink. It won't hurt a thing. Finally, he can offer compromises, as he did to Jesus, promising worldly power in exchange for worship. He says, 
I'll give you prestige and power if you can cause people to act according to my will. So let me ask you, do any political or even religious figures come to mind? <clears throat> I won't mention any names. Another way is by deception. This is another powerful means to encourage us to sin. Satan is the king of liars, and on top of that, he's very clever. One common ploy is to convince us that something good can be accomplished by doing something wrong. It worked with Adam and Eve. It also works today as when mobs destroy property and lives so that the world will <clears throat> become a better place. Or when politicians spew lies and half-truths to further their own agendas, all the while promising better lives for all. Satan doesn't care about truth in advertising. When he appears to us, he doesn't present himself as the devil, no, no. Rather, he presents himself as someone who wants to soothe, to encourage, to instruct. Satan's an angel, remember. There were many instances in the Bible where God's messengers or angels appeared to humans. The humans were none the wiser at the time. In the same way, Satan can appear to us. Surely he did not appear to David and say, David, <clears throat> I hate you and I have a nasty plan for your life so that I can destroy you. You must cooperate and begin by committing adultery with Bathsheba. Satan never shows us the consequences of our sin. His strategy is to give people what they want, but to make sure they eventually get what he wants them to have. So how does a mouse trap work? You catch the mice while you remain out of sight. The trap holds out the promise of food and fulfillment while keeping the consequences concealed. The mice only see the cheese, but not the powerful wire and spring, and they don't get a second chance. Paul recognized this trick of Satan when he warned the believers in Corinth about false teachers. Remember, Satan's goal is to have people worship him. He's smart enough to know that people will not worship a creature that looks and acts like a scary dragon. However, if he sets up a rival and false religion and people think they are worshiping God, well, you know, that might just work. Enter the New Agers and other Christian cult religions. Have you ever heard of Creeflo Dollar? He's the mega church minister who preaches that God wants us to be wealthy. He's the one who asked his parishioners to send him 300 bucks each so he could buy a $65 million luxury jet to spread his ministry, which he did purchase, by the way. When he reminds desperate folks of the promise of everlasting life, a mansion in the sky, and being reuni reunited with loved ones in the same vein of helping his ministry to spread the word, they bite. I can just see Mother Teresa owning two Rolls Royces and several multi-million dollar homes. I think we all know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it as a lead-in. How did Christ's death and resurrection assure us that our soul would be delivered from Satan's power? There's no doubt that we are all guilty. Satan knows that and constantly reminds God of Ezekiel's words. The soul who sins will die. But you know what? He's not telling God anything God doesn't already know. The question then is really, so what should be done with us? What Satan could not foresee was that God had a plan whereby justice would be done. Our debt would be paid, but not by ourselves, but by another. For those who accept Christ as their substitute, forgiveness has been granted. It has been granted for all the sins we have ever committed and all the ones we still will commit. Of course, we must still confess them and repent. But just as Satan accuses us before the Father, so Christ speaks out on our behalf before God, and God accepts his plea. Martin Luther said that the devil is God's devil. 
What did he mean by that? What he meant was that it is God who gives the devil his power, but he has not a hairbreadth more power over us than God's goodness permits. He's really God's slave. So, if that is true, Satan must have a purpose. What could it be? Here are some possibilities. Number one, God uses Satan to teach the obedient. Job was a pillar of obedience in God's eyes. However, he allowed Satan to torment his life to prove that Job would not forsake and to show where his heart was. Poor Job had no idea of why God seemed to turn his back on him, but he never faltered in his faith. In the end, Job's understanding of God was enhanced when God gave him a lecture, and boy, what a lecture that was. You should read it sometime. Afterwards, Job finally admits, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Could we pass the same test? What's another way? God uses Satan to discipline the disobedient. In Corinthians, Paul delivered an immoral man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. He did this by recommending the man be expelled from the church so that he was returned to Satan's territory. The hope was that the man would repent and be driven back into the fold. So what's another purpose? God uses Satan to refine the obedient. In the case of Paul, it was the thorn in his flesh sent by a messenger of Satan. Paul begged God to remove his thorn, but God told him that it was there to keep him from becoming conceited from God's blessings. God told him that his grace was sufficient, that his power was made perfect in weakness. Paul finally accepted this thorn, and we would do well to remember this reasoning when we encounter thorns in our lives. Luther points to Satan entering into our lives by knocking on a door. If we open it only a little, he'll gain a foothold in our lives. Here's a few doors of influence that we might encounter, and I'm sure there are many more. The first one, of course, is pride. This thinking puts us in the center of our own lives. It was the first sin. Another one is anger. It's not a sin to be angry. It's how we handle our anger and act on it that is the problem. Satan is waiting to direct us down the wrong path. Hatred and murder. Just watch an hour of TV and we can see readily that Satan is truly the god of this age. What about guilt? Satan uses feelings of guilt to convince us that our sin is too great to be forgiven so we should just accept that fact. The irony is that Satan first tempts us to sin, and then if we do, he accuses us before God for doing exactly what he encouraged us to do. All right, we have false religions. Many false religions are easy to discern, such as witchcraft, relying on mediums, and so forth. However, there are many religions that claim to be Christian, and even have many beliefs that sound logical, such as focus on the family, dedication to evangelism, and so forth. But when you dig deeper, you find non-scriptural beliefs and practices. Buyer beware. Fear. We're not talking about being afraid of electricity or crossing the street. We're talking about debilitating and irrationally unwarranted fear. When we spend our time and our energies being afraid of something, we're really saying that we don't really trust in God to protect us or deliver us from whatever it is that has us captive. Anything that diminishes our full trust in God is pleasing to Satan. Finally, we have various vices. When we become addicted to something, it becomes the focus of our lives and our relationship with God becomes secondary. Satan jumps for joy. 
So, let's look at a few takeaways as we conclude here. First of all, when we hear the knockings of the serpent, we got to resist the temptation to open the door, even a little. If we do, it'll be easier to open a little wider the next time. Unfortunately, God holds us accountable for succumbing to our temptations. Telling God that the devil made me do it does not relieve us of our responsibilities. Another takeaway is that God uses conflict with Satan to develop character. Don't you think that God could have cast Satan into the lake of fire the moment he rebelled? God chose to allow Satan to exist for our benefit. That sounds strange, but Satan allows us to learn about our own faith, about God's power, about God's chastisement, and about his grace. Remember, God always gives us the resources to stand against the enemy. And finally, we have to realize that God has absolute sovereignty in his universe. He's the ultimate cause of all that happens. He is able to use even Satan in fulfilling his ultimate plan. We must absolutely know that in the end, Satan will be defeated. The more we realize the greatness of God, the smaller Satan will appear. Satan only has as much power as we give him.